Welcome to today's Michigan Engineering DEI lecture. I'm Kathy Sevener. I'm a DEI lecturer and Associate Research Scientist in Materials Science and Engineering. These DEI lectures are an important element of our People First Engineering and our launch of DEI 2.0. We appreciate you being a part of the learning and growing together as a community. It is my pleasure to introduce our panel of speakers today. Um, in today's presentation, we will hear from Sarah Hoffman, the DEI Curriculum Develop Man Development Manager for the Center for Socially Engaged Design. Sarah leads content development for the DEI Case Study Initiative and partners with College of Engineering faculty to implement cases in undergraduate engineering classrooms. Lisa Latuka, the Director and Professor in the Center for Study of Higher and Post-Secondary Education. Lisa studies how academic and disciplinary cultures shape faculty work and undergraduate student learning, and often collaborates with engineering colleagues in studying these issues in engineering contexts. Tricia Pendergrover, Director of the Center for Research on Learning and Teaching in Engineering. Tricia serves as the Director of CRLT Engine, where she leads a team focused on advancing engineering education in the College of Engineering through innovative programming, strategic partnerships, and cultivating individual relationships. <clears throat> Steve Skirlos, Arthur F. Thurnau, Professor of Mechanical Engineering and the Faculty Director for the Center for Socially Engaged Engineering and Design. Steve develops, sorry, excuse me, Steve works to develop te technological and educational strategies that increase the sustainability and equity of engineering systems generated by a holistically trained workforce applying socially engaged engineering and design practices. Uh, just a, a little note, um, any sort of housekeeping, uh, you can keep an eye on the chat um, when the question, uh, you'll see where their question link is. Uh, but let's go ahead and start and please welcome Tricia Pendergrover, who will be today's first speaker. Hello, everyone. It is indeed my pleasure to begin our conversation today and speak with you about teaching equity-centered engineering and development of a comprehensive approach to teaching equity. Um, the T-Center, or the Teaching Engineering Equity Center, is an NSF-sponsored initiative that has as our ultimate goal to create teaching environments where equity and inclusion are valued in both the technical content and the teaching style. One of our, our central research question for our T-Center is essentially this, how can we effectively integrate DEI concepts into engineering curricula? And this effort um, in developing um, engineering education where students from a range of backgrounds can experience inclusion and belonging um, is central to, to the work that we're doing. And in particular, our uh, T-Center has three aims. The first is to um, the first is to develop an evidence-based framework for creating an equity engineering curriculum. The second is to create a flexible library of DEI case studies um, and other resources that can be integrated into discipline-specific uh, technical courses and reflect the salience of, of equity concerns and engineering practices. And then the third. Um, objective of our T-Center is to establish a replicable, uh, replicable and adaptive training and implementation infrastructure that enables instructors to create um, equitable teaching and learning environments and use activities um, that promote student success for all students. And so in this presentation today, um, each of us who are serving as leads of the T-Center will provide an overview of our approach and share our progress to date. And so specifically, um, the way that we're going to divide our time with you all today is we will each share about 10 minutes uh, update for each of these objectives, and then we'll turn it back to our moderator, um, Kathy, for questions and answers. And so now I'll turn it over to Lisa, who serves as the lead for our first objective. Lisa. Thanks, Tricia. You can advance that slide for me, please. So good afternoon, everyone. Um, let me begin by introducing you to the T Scholars Group. Um, it includes uh, faculty from the College of Engineering, our colleague Steve Skurlos, Joy Mondiza, and Shanna Daly, our colleague in the Department of Sociology, Erin Seck, um, also Erica Mozioski from the Center for Socially Engaged Design, and Gren Marie Agrasar from CRLT Engine, 
And our work is really made possible due to the work of our wonderful postdoctoral researcher, Laura Wood, and the, a group of four uh, amazing doctoral students in higher education in the School of Education. Okay, you can advance, Tershia. Okay. So as Tushia said, the goal of the T scholars is to build an evidence-based framework that will guide the design and delivery of equity-centered engineering courses. And we call it a curricular and instructional framework to signal that it's intended to support both the inclusion of equity content in a course or even a set of courses in an engineering program and the use of instructional approaches to teach that content. So you might imagine from that description that the framework needs to be pretty flexible. It needs to be able to assist a single faculty member who's working on a course or a group of faculty working on a sequence of courses. It also needs to accommodate courses with different kinds of learning objectives, as well as students who are at different stages in their engineering studies, and also in different stages of learning about issues of equity. We also want our framework to be useful to faculty beyond U of M. So the work we plan to do will help us reach that goal as well. And at the bottom of this slide, you can see the work that we're undertaking. Um, it includes conversations among the T scholars about what it actually means to design and deliver an equity-centered course. We need that shared understanding to do the work together. Um, in addition, we need to understand the work that's already been done to date and how it might help us develop this framework. So we're doing that by reviewing the literature and that's theory, research and practice literatures in engineering and STEM fields primarily to help us identify and consider different elements that we might want to include in the framework. Okay. Additionally, we're interviewing engineering instructors who are already teaching courses that substantively address issues of equity. And we're also interviewing instructional staff who are supporting the development and implementation of these kinds of courses. So I'm going to say more about what we're learning in a moment, but the first thing I want to do is make clear why we think this work is necessary and urgent. And Tershia, can you advance, please? So we believe, along with many other engineering educators across the United States and globally, that an equity-centered engineering curriculum requires that we change some of the ways we think about engineering education. So I'm going to talk about each of these. So if you look at the undergraduate curriculum in most institutions, you will see that engineering is dominated by courses in mathematics, engineering science, and the technical courses in the major. That curriculum offers a pretty strong message. It tells us what kinds of knowledge and ideas are valued in engineering and which are not, okay? And that curriculum also typically sends the message that scientific and technical knowledge are objective forms of knowledge, that they're unaffected by human values or human actions. This dominant focus on the technical aspects of engineering and the idea that technical work is really unaffected by humans and their values actually masks the reality that engineering work is always conducted in socio-cultural contexts. And what we mean by that is that it's always affected, whether we choose to recognize that or not, by larger social and cultural forces that shape human lives, that shape the ideas that we have in a particular place and time, and what knowledge we think counts as science and engineering. So those larger social and cultural forces shape both engineering practice and engineering education. And we can see the emphasis on the technical and scientific aspects of engineering and the neglect of these sort of socio-cultural and socio-technical dimensions of engineering and the kinds of textbook problems that we often ask students to solve. Those problems are too often decontextualized. They ask for a kind of plug and chug solution and they don't present engineering work authentically. So they don't give students the opportunity to think critically about their work as engineers. So if that's the engineering curriculum we're teaching, it's what students will learn. And it won't be surprising that what they learn is that there's no place in engineering education or practice for considerations of equity and the impact of engineering work on the people and the world around us. If you'll advance, Tershia. Okay. So at this point, let me just tell you a bit about what we're learning and doing. So this is a concept map. It's about a 20,000 foot view of the landscape of literature related to equity-centered teaching and engineering, STEM, and engineering and STEM fields. And the goal of this review, as I said, is to understand what educators are already doing to center work in their engineering courses. So it's important to say that there is actually an abundant literature on things like inclusive teaching and the barriers to achieving this focus 
on equity in engineering courses, but there's a lot less attention to how to teach the content of a course, including the technical content of a course in ways that engage students in thinking about relevant issues of equity that can arise. Also important, there's not much research at all on the effectiveness of these teaching and curricular practices that are described in the literature. So that's the work of the T scholars and it's why the work of the T Center is so important and so needed. Even as we can identify elements that we might include in our curriculum and instructional framework from this literature, we also see where the gaps are. So our goal is, design, is to both design and to test a framework that not only helps engineers teach inclusively, but that helps them integrate questions of equity into courses that have been almost solely focused on the technical dimensions of engineering. And you can advance, Tricia. So I noted earlier that we're learning from faculty or staff who are already doing this work. They may not be publishing it. And for that reason, we're supplementing our literature review with interviews with engineering instructors and instructional staff. And we've completed 21 of these interviews to date and we'll continue this work throughout this academic year. Uh, so far, we've interviewed folks from 10 engineering schools, and our scope is widening as we do each individual, uh, each additional interview. And we're also purposefully interviewing faculty across engineering disciplines so that we get a sense of the ways in which engineers are doing this work throughout the, engin the undergraduate engineering curriculum. And you can advance, Tricia. Okay. So what are we learning about equity-centered engineering education? I want to share with you some emerging principles. Oh, hang on, Tricia. <laughs> That's fine. You can leave that. Uh, here are some principles that we're currently using to guide our framework. So it's important to say this is not the framework. That work is ongoing. These are the principles that are guiding us as we think about the framework. Okay. So I'll go through these quickly for you. So we think these engineering, uh, these courses that center um, questions of engineering equity have to, have to encourage ongoing personal reflection on the part of faculty and, in and their students on their biases and positionality. They need to integrate this socio-technical view of engineering practice that will counter the views of engineering work as objective and value-free and decontextualized. These courses really need to critically examine the intersections of identity and power and privilege in society because those influences the processes and outcomes of engineering practice. These courses would also need to develop and assess students' own developing capacity to identify and address and reflect on inequities in engineering practice with the goal of helping them address them or alleviate them. And finally, a course like this has to cultivate an equitable classroom interaction among peers and with instructors and with students um, so that it supports students and instructors as co-learners in this work. And that's an important concept. Tertia, you can advance. Okay. So I suggested we're in the early stages of this work. Uh, these are our current and next steps. First, as I said, we'll continue our R&D work. We'll continue to learn from engineering faculty who are doing the work and the staff colleagues who are supporting it. And we'll continue to review the literature to help us ground the framework in both practice and theory and research. This is meant to culminate in the design of an initial framework that we'll implement with collaborating, collaborating instructors at University of Michigan. In addition, we'll conduct studies of the implementation of this framework because we need to understand whether it's effective, both in supporting instructors and achieving the kinds of learning outcomes and equitable, equitable classroom relations that we think are essential if instructors and students are to do this work together as co-learners. So we would start these studies at the University of Michigan, but then we would engage partners in other engineering schools to continue to evaluate and refine this framework so that it works in places beyond the University of Michigan. And finally, it's very important to say that what we need to do is we need to use what we learn to build professional development opportunities that will fully support engineering instructors who want to do this work. We know the work is complex and challenging, and one of our goals has to be working alongside instructors who take it on so that we can support their learning as they learn to support their students in their learning about how issues of equity arise in engineering practice. So the last words I'll leave you with are challenge and care and compassion. 
we need to undertake the challenge of teaching equity-centered courses with care and compassion for everyone who's involved. And I'll look forward to your questions. Thank you. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, thank you, Tershia. Um, to um, move into objective two, um, we're now narrowing the focus into the content uh, that the students experience. So objective two of the T-Center is really considering a simple question. What if considering equity was seamlessly included in the content engineering students are learning? Uh, so objective two uh, is really approaching this by developing original case studies for engineering courses, highlighting the impact of engineering work on engineers and society, and bringing some awareness to the tools and methods for considering inherent power, privilege, and identity factors in engineering students' work and ultimately their work as professional engineers. Uh, the um, DEI case studies are, are focused on real world histories and are closely connected to any engineering subject. Addressing the irony, if you will, and the ineffectiveness of othering DEI by separating it from conventional engineering instructor, uh, instruction. Uh, we're working with a highly talented groups, uh, group of folks led by Dr. Sarah Hoffman, who I'm going to turn it over to in just a minute. Um, and before doing that, I just want to mention that we are supported by two NSF grants. Uh, one is the uh, T-Center, which we're talking about today, but also another National Science Foundation grant on socially engaged engineering toolboxes. Now, this particular aspect of the work's also been supported by seed funding provided by the College of Engineering through the Office of the Associate Dean for Undergraduate Education, uh, currently under the leadership of Professor Kevin Pipe. And that made uh, sort of the, the case study approach possible, which we're now leveraging here uh, in the T-Center. Uh, so I want to turn it over to Dr. Sarah Hoffman. Uh, Sarah is a historian who's been leading us through this case study journey for roughly four years. She's going to walk us through the progress to date and share more about the philosophy and approach uh, to case studies in the context of the T-Center. Thanks, Steve. Uh, yeah, so as Steve mentioned, the case study initiative is really about demonstrating that social issues are inherently part of engineering by bringing these real world examples to engineering classrooms. And I think you can see on the slide, it represents the library of cases overall, those that are completed and currently in progress. Uh, and I think you can see the range of topics represented even just visually. We have a short amount of time today. So what I want to do is just share a bit about what the cases are and provide some examples of what they look like in practice. So on the next slide, uh, as a starting point, uh, I think it's helpful to define uh, what we even mean by cases, because I think the term case can mean really different things to different people. And so, you know, we're talking about much more than just a single example slide or curating existing materials on the syllabus. As Steve mentioned, my own background is in history, and I really do think of the case studies as micro histories, by which I mean taking an in-depth exploration of a single engineering solution, whether that takes the form of a product, a service, an event, and using that as an entry point for understanding broader um, issues in engineering disciplines. So, you know, for example, we have a case study on a new artificial heart technology. It fits the chest cavities of 86% of men, but just 14% of women. Why? Uh, the case study explores how those kinds of disparities were actually created by very technical decisions about the, the pump that was used and how those technical decisions relate to broader trends of gender bias in healthcare. Um, importantly, you know, as we're researching these histories, we use that research to create our own materials, which I think as you'll see is also really important in being able to tailor the topics for engineering students in particular disciplines and in specific courses within those disciplines. So on the next slide, we'll see uh, that within the library, there are actually three major categories of cases. Uh, what we're calling global cases focus on the impacts of engineering on people and the environment. Uh, so for example, we have a case study on Hurricane Katrina that analyzes how the failures of levees and flood walls you know, during that storm amplified racial and socioeconomic disparities in New Orleans. I'm gonna say more about that one in just a second. The second category, the local cases are focused more specifically on interpersonal and systemic dynamics uh, of engineering spaces. So for example, we have a local case on the widely publicized firing of Timnit Gebru from Google AI uh, back in 2020. And that case analyzes how Google's explanation of her departure 
functioned as a dominant narrative, and it asks students to explore counter narratives uh, in light of her broader experience as a Black woman at Google. And then lastly, the historical cases are really getting at the structural roots of these issues and aspects of engineering history that are maybe not as widely discussed in engineering spaces today. So for example, we have a historical case that's focused on Elijah McCoy, a prolific inventor from Ipsy who secured dozens of patents in his lifetime, uh, mostly related to lubrication for trains and manufacturing applications. And the case invites students to think in a nuanced way about some of the barriers that he overcame as a black engineer in the late 19th and early 20th century. It analyzes his first invention, an oil cup for trains, uh, technically speaking, as an example of a proportional feedback control. And then more broadly, we're asking students to reflect on how engineering history is preserved and shared. What are the stories that tend to be told, which don't get told as often, and why? Um, on the next slide, uh, to give you a feel for what it looks like for students to experience these cases, I wanna share a little more detail on just one of these examples. So as I mentioned, our, our case study on Hurricane Katrina is really focused on Katrina as an example of engineering failure uh, and looking at the ways that it amplified racial and socioeconomic disparities that had been present in New Orleans for a, a really long time. And so as they move through the case, students are systematically introduced to multiple layers of context for the events that took place during Katrina, to the geography and some of the unique environmental uh, considerations in the New Orleans region, to some of the political pressures that shaped the process of designing and constructing that system over a very long period of time, and then specifically to the history of two particular neighborhoods impacted by the flooding, one upper middle class and majority white, uh, one working class and majority black. From a technical perspective, students analyze some of the structural failures of the levees and flood walls, the sites of breaches in those uh, two neighborhoods, and think about how those failures in those cases related to the environmental and social issues that have been introduced. And from there, they trace out the trajectory of the recovery in those areas. You know, both of those neighborhoods were initially submerged right after the storm, but they took really different paths in their recovery in the years that followed. And we ask students to think through that. Ultimately, you know, we're asking students to reflect on how crucial contextual factors are in engineering problem solving and to reflect on what it means for engineers to be accountable for their failures and I think that's particularly salient in the case of Katrina, um, where it's so obvious how much uh, human suffering resulted from those failures. When we introduce this content in a classroom, we adapt the format to fit the instructor's needs. So we have uh, a more compressed version that can be done with a short pre-reading and a single in-class workshop. And we also have a semester-long experience that combines readings, technical homework, and exam questions, and classroom discussion as a thread throughout the entire semester. Uh, from here, if we want to go to the next slide, I think as we've developed these cases over the past several years, the Katrina case and the others, we've distilled some key principles that guide us in identifying effective case topics and developing our teaching strategy. At the top of that list, of course, is socio-technical integration, uh, that is making these connections between technical and social issues explicit, which we think is very essential to avoiding othering of this type of content. Uh, as Lisa was just referencing. Uh, additionally, we think a realistic representation of the complexity that engineers face is important. Engineers don't work in a vacuum. They face numerous constraints in real world practice and the cases are intended to reflect that and scaffolded to help students think through things like business considerations, regulatory processes, environmental concerns, histories of social disparities, all are intersecting with engineering decision-making. The next two on the list, uh, multi-partiality and ambiguity, I think go hand in hand. By multi-partiality, what we mean is making issues of identity, power, and privilege visible in the classroom. Uh, but at the same time, we don't tell students what to think. We don't preach to them. Rather, you know, we're selecting topics and framing cases in ways that are intended to help students build critical thinking skills over time by working through problems that don't have a single answer or an easy fix. And then lastly, in terms of reflexivity, I think we also recognize that there are limits to what we can do in a single workshop or even over the course of an entire semester. And so we're stressing teaching reflective processes that students can apply in other contexts as they continue working out their own values as engineers. The last slide uh, for me uh, recaps where we are so far. I think ultimately we're finding that this kind of approach to socio-technical integration is relevant in a wide range of courses. Uh, the slide shows a snapshot of our progress to date. 
We have 17 cases complete with another nine or 10 uh, in the works. We're using materials across the college with faculty from almost a dozen departments represented so far. And we've already engaged several thousand students and that's both in-class workshops and then asynchronous modules and readings and reflections uh, and many more to come in the second half of this semester. I think within these numbers, it's helpful to, to note that in past years, we've had a lot of success in first year design and capstone experiences, but this year we're making significant progress in embedding more deeply in these core technical courses in the second and third year as well, which we think is important in, in providing continuity across a student's engineering experience. So, you know, I think we're really excited by the traction this work has gotten so far. And as, you know, We've mentioned we really see this as just the beginning of what's possible in bringing equity concerns directly into engineering course content. Uh, and from here, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Tershia to talk about the teaching circles. Thanks, Sarah. Um, so now I'd like to focus on our third objective for our center. Um, and that is this idea of rep, uh, developing a replicable and adaptive training and implementation infrastructure that will enable engineering instructors to use equity-centered learning activities and really create um, learning environments where all students can thrive. And so we use the faculty learning community as our infrastructure, and we call these uh, teaching circles. Um, and so I am really delighted to have uh, a really great group of folks over at Cyril T and Engineering who support this work with me, um, Dr. Gren Marie Agrasar, uh, Dr. Patty Hymas, as well as uh, Dr. Jade Wang. Um, and they have been working with me over the last year or so working on these um, teaching circles. And so just to kind of talk through um, what are teaching circles? So at Cyril T and Engineering, um, teaching circles are faculty learning communities that are designed to really empower instructors to institute best practices to, to support all their students. And so we designed the sessions to be an ongoing professional development experience that support faculty reflection and help them to transform their teaching practice. Um, so faculty learning communities are grounded in the exploration of educational literature and local data when it's available. They also include reflection on individuals' practice and peer feedback. For these programs, um, faculty design a deliverable that reflects their implementation of practices that are discussed and that will ultimately be adapted for their teaching context. And I'll describe these uh, deliverables a little bit later. Um, for their efforts, um, our faculty receive a stipend for their participation. And so over the course of eight months, we've completed, um, we've offered a pilot um, teaching circle last fall, um, and we received feedback from our external evaluator, and we've revised our teaching circles based upon that uh, feedback, and we've had a secondary run in May of this year. And so Let's uh, let me share a little bit about who our participants are um, in both the initial pilot and our two options that were offered in the spring. Um, faculty represented a variety of department and programs across the College of Engineering here at Michigan and a variety of roles, including lecturers, tenure track faculty and tenured faculty. The fall pilot uh, participants engaged in 10 sessions over the course of five months during the academic year. And so because of this, we offered them a stipend of about $2,000, which is higher than what we typically do. Um, but it was in part because of the um, detailed uh, and additional amount of work that they had to do as part of their participation. Um, there were two options that we offered in the springtime, and so for each option, these faculty engaged in five sessions over the course of two and a half weeks in May, and they received the stipend of $1,000, which is our typical amount for teaching circles. Option one was for faculty who are beginning their journey to better understanding equity in the engineering context. And option two was for faculty who have a foundational understanding of equity and are interested in deepening their knowledge on this topic, specifically as it relates to teaching and learning. And faculty self-identified which option that they wanted to participate in. And we offered them a brief questionnaire to help them identify which option would work best for them. And so as we, as Lisa described earlier, you know, our, our frame or our approach to designing our teaching circles is essentially that we believe that to teach equity-centered engineering, we must also center equity in our practice. 
And so because of this understanding, um, our training and implementation infrastructure um, support, support faculty and their ability to develop students to become equity-minded engineers. And it also is um, helping faculty to create learning environments that center equity as a teaching practice. To that end, our teaching circles introduce faculty to theories, frameworks, uh, case studies, and practices to support equitable and inclusive teaching. And to further, it provides a supportive environment for faculty to engage in conversations, um, to revise their course, uh, course materials, and exchange feedback on those materials. And so specifically, by the end of the teaching circle, faculty participants are able to reflect on how their own identities and beliefs and experiences affect their approach to teaching engineering. They're able to contextualize sort of current in inequities that exist within the context of U.S. history. Um, and they do that through examining scholarly literature and the case studies um, that Sarah mentioned um, and other resources. And then finally, they're able to use their knowledge and tools and strategies that we've talked about throughout the teaching circle to design and implement um, for their equity, uh, for their engineering courses, excuse me. And so for the next couple slides, I will highlight some of the ways we put those objectives into practice. So specifically for the first learning objective, yeah, there we go. For the first learning objective, um, where we have faculty to reflect on their own identities, we specifically tackle this through reflective exercises. And so as an example, in option one, we have faculty engage in what we call the soup activity, where they use this analogy to help them think about the various aspects of their social identity. Um, and they were prompted to think about the ways in which their identities impact their everyday life, as well as have implications for their teaching. And so your base broth of your soup might be your race, ethnicity, or your gender, as an example. For the second learning objective, objective um, <clears throat> We engaged our faculty with a timeline activity where we examined the history of higher ed um, in the U.S. and overlay that with the history of civil rights to highlight the ways in which historical inequities impact how higher education was formed and how it influenced engineering as a discipline. We also engage directly in conversations about a variety of myths um, about engineering, which suggest false notions um, that engineering is free from political and social influences, as an example. Further, um, when we look to objective three, um, we raise um, through our teaching circle, we raise faculty awareness about several tools and strategies. And so in particular, um, we discuss the possibility for them to think about incorporating diversity, equity, and inclusion learning objectives into their course. Um, we also um, discuss course designs and the ways in which faculty can incorporate principles of equity through their principles, um, through their policies, excuse me, through their course content and their assessment. And we also discuss how do you best navigate some of the hot moments and difficult conversations that could exist if when you bring up conversations and, and topics around around um, inclusion and equity. Um, so for our third um, learning objective as well, um, we wanted faculty to be able to create a deliverable, which will really allow them to take what they've learned and apply it to their own teaching context. And so there are two possible deliverables that faculty could do. Um, for those who participated in option one, they had to create an equity focused course element and they got it. They had the opportunity to choose if they wanted to revise their syllabus or an assignment, an in-class activity or an assessment. Um, and they really had that, that privilege or that ability to choose what works best for their con class context. For faculty who chose option two, they completed a 10 minute practice teaching session on a topic of their choice, which would help um, them be able to facilitate a conversation or activity around um, some sort of equity centered. <clears throat> and then the pilot participants completed both deliverables one and two. And so one aspect of our teaching circle that's been really important for us is our evaluation. And so we work with our external evaluator, CEDAR, the Center for Education Design Evaluation and Research. And they interviewed our program participants immediately after the teaching circle. And as I mentioned earlier, 
um, we use that initial feedback to make changes to our teaching circle for the MATE offerings. And so some of the evaluation um, focused on what did faculty find most or least useful? What challenges did they face? And were they satisfied overall with the, the structure of the teaching circle? And so some key takeaways from our evaluations. Um, we have several strengths that we want to highlight. Overall, faculty really appreciated um, this experience. It was overwhelmingly a uh, positive one for them. They appreciated the, the discussion with their peers and having the opportunity to talk about equity and to learn about those case studies and discuss them and think about the historical context. They also appreciated the structure of the teaching circles and us as facilitators um, leading them through those conversations. In terms of some lessons learned, um, there was definitely a need to have two different entry points. And so that's why we created this option one and two to allow faculty that opportunity. Um, they also, uh, faculty were also interested in, in having an opportunity to uh, kind of adjust our timing so that they can engage more. So we increased the time for some of our teaching circles and we also spent some time um, supporting a shift to going to May so that faculty could have more dedicated time outside of the typical academic year. Um, and then finally, faculty were really interested in more examples. And so that's some of the things that we are working to increase and to continue to uh, gather those implementation ideas. And so in terms of our next steps, um, we are really excited about the, the ways that we're moving forward with the teaching circles. And so um, we are su supporting those in initial set of instructors by offering a community of practice this semester so they can continue to discuss and have conversations about how to best implement um, some of the equity um, examples and activities in their classes. Um, we are continuing to evaluate and write about the work that we're doing. And then also we are going to be offering the teaching circle again in May of 2024. And so um, in the chat, we have a link there so that you can express your interest so that when we get a little bit closer to May, you'll be able to um, have more information sent your way. And so we are really excited about all that's to come. And we look forward to hearing from you all all what questions you have um, about uh, the Teaching Engineering Equity Center. Thank you all so much. And I, now I'll turn it over to Kathy for questions for Q&A for us. Well, thank you very much, uh, Tricia, Sarah, uh, Lisa, and Steve. Um, we have a couple of questions. Um, that we were pre-submitted and then we'll move on to live questions. And thank you to everyone who's already submitted questions in the Q&A. Please go ahead and if you have questions while this discussion is going on, add your questions into the Q&A and we'll get to them. Uh, the first question to the panel would be, while we are not responsible for others' instruction practices, how can I as an individual encourage and support others to adopt these practices? Yeah, thanks, Kathy. That's a really good question. And I think I'll I'll try to start off and um, I invite my colleagues to, to jump in. Um, I think it's important to really model first yourself about thinking about the adoption of these practices. And so really um, doing some of your own internal work and reflection on how do you best uh, integrate um, some of these um, um, techniques and uh, approaches in your own classes. And so I would encourage faculty to look inward to think about their own individual professional development first. Um, at Serialty Engineering, we have some resources on our website to help faculty to kind of do some of that initial reflection on that. Um, but I think part of um, what's really awesome about what I've seen in the teaching circles is simply sharing what you're doing and highlighting the work that you're doing in your classes and the way your students are responding to it. Um, I think that is a really effective way to begin that conversation to see whether or not something will work in another context. Because regardless of what strategy or technique or activity that you do, you really do need to tailor it and customize it for your particular teaching context and who you are as an instructor, your identities matter um, as it relates to how um, you want to move forward in, in using different kinds of um, techniques and strategies and so forth. So those are some of the first things that come to mind um, from, from my perspective, but um, I'll, I'll see if others um, want, want to share as well. Yeah, I would say Trisha has a, quite a comprehensive answer. I, I, I'm not sure I have anything to add uh, to that. 
So we had a related question come in um, from the audience is that, is it part of T's role uh, to persuade faculty to adopt the frameworks you're developing? I think that the answer is no. Uh, if I, that's my answer. <laughs> is no. Um, I, it, what we're doing is um, acknowledging that people are at different parts of their journey, and you have lead adopters. You have, uh, you know, then you know, sort of fast followers, and you know, on through the diffusion curve. And there's plenty of work to do uh, to empower um, and better understand. Uh, the approaches in the context of those early adopters. So we are primarily working with early adopters and even within the T-Center, the different um, objectives that we talked about today, you see folks at different stages of the journey, even you know maybe gravitating toward one objective or uh, toward toward another. So um, that you know I, th I think that that's where we're, be we're beginning right now. Another question that we have is, um, are there engineering fields or engineering applications where equity integration is more challenging than others? Yes, <laughs> yes, yes. I, I think, um, actually Lisa brought this up in, in the context of objective one, you know, in regards to one of the, the key challenges to in, integrating DEI into engineering, curriculum courses is the fact that engineering tends to be decontextualized. So uh, without calling fields out or classes out, uh, some are more decontextualized than others. And the more decontextualized it is, or the further from application it is, or the further from interactions between engineers as part and parcel to that work as, it, as it's appreciated in, 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 in the teaching of it, um, the more challenging it's going to be. Um, nevertheless, uh, we've we found creative ways, um, even in, in quite decontextualized areas, um, to find that context, to introduce that context. And uh, I think it's our sp experience so far in the early days that students appreciate it. I think I'd just add to what Steve is saying. I think the DEI case studies are a great example of how you can do this. And I also think that this is why the T-Center is bigger, is, is bigger, right? It, it, we need a curricular and instructional framework that can help faculty members develop this content, think about how to teach it, try it out, have support as they do that, maybe the support of colleagues, perhaps some t a teaching circle as a beginning way to do this. I think this is, we're trying to think comprehensively about how to support that work um, because it will, it, it will be different in different fields and we have to be adapted to do that. So uh, Lisa, I appreciate that you brought up the case studies because there's a couple of questions regarding those um, case studies. One is if I'm ready to start using some of these case slash micro histories in class, is the teaching circle the next step or are you meeting with individuals about cases and what might make sense in their con their course context? I can maybe- so okay. yeah, yeah, I'll go ahead, Sarah, and I'll jump in after you. Sure. I guess uh, maybe what I would say is, is both that I'm I meet really regularly with faculty members to talk about their courses and understand the things that they're teaching and how a case might fit. And then simultaneously, I think when we think about how cases uh, are experienced by students in a course, part of that is how the instructor is is talking about these issues all semester long and the kind of climate that they're creating. And so I think the teaching circles are a really helpful companion to that and helping instructors uh, create the kind of environment where the cases land most effectively. Um, but uh, if you haven't signed up for a teaching circle yet, I would be really happy to talk to you about how to put one in your course. Yeah, all I was going to say is that there are multiple paths um, to engaging with the case studies and uh, definitely see Sarah um, if you're interested in doing it immediately. But I think um, one of the things that is really helpful is 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 also thinking about the broader perspective that um, Sarah just mentioned, Re really thinking about your whole course and thinking about, um, do you just want to have a one moment in your class um, or do you want to really think broader um, so that it feels very much integrated into what you're you're doing? And I think um, the folks over at CSED do a lovely job in terms of thinking about that. And then we can also partner as well at CRLT and engineering to help think about the, the course overall too. And I guess related to the um, case studies as well, could you share how global 
uh, systemic co uh, concepts such as colonization and imperialization are woven into faculty development and curriculum, uh, both historically and as it shows up in the present day. I think that that's going to be a little bit trickier because I think that the case studies are really geared to the students and then the faculty developments geared to the faculty development. So we're not trying to address both of those, you know, with with any particular approach. I think what um, you've heard, you know, through the last couple of, of questions and answers is trying to address um I don't want to say from all sides, it's not from all sides, but certainly thinking about, you know, curricular framework, thinking about um uh, instructor development, the environment of the classroom, and then the very specific content the students experience uh, within the within the um, within the content. Now, in regards to you know uh, colonialism, imperialism, um, I I don't think we we have systematic because you start to get into not micro historical case studies but history, um, which I think is actually a super important um, context. Um, which, you know, might supplement a discussion of, you know, a particular engineering uh, uh, situation. You know, I, th I think it's important around the case study specifically to um, note that these are more, they, you know, they might be framed in terms of, you know, how a, a corporation um, has had an impact on, you know, its clients or interactions of engineers in a company or, a um you know a, you know historical figure in engineering um who either transcended or certainly faced um you know a lot of systemic issues um so we're not taking as much of the long arc of history in the cases as we are um examining situations because we're trying to get students to be thinking in that way very specifically but that's not to discount the important a uh, broader context of, of the question. I think that's important. And, and that's something I think I'd like to actually think more about. One thing that I will add um, to that as it relates to thinking about the teaching circles is that, you know, one of the elements that we have and one of the activities that we we focus on is really beginning an introduction to some of the historical elements that have shaped um, the U.S. context. Um, and really identifying those iniquities through that um, understanding. And I think what is um, really important is that oftentimes this is not necessarily something that um, we were taught. Even if you were born in the U.S., you were not necessarily taught all of, all of that history. Um, and so really thinking about when different um, aspects um, of, you know, um, when was Jim Crow and how does that overlap to when the first institution um, in engineering was founded? Like really thinking about like um, some of those um, those moments in history and where we were as engineering um, as we were developing the, the field of engineering within our context. And I think that can be actually really um, um, revealing to understand like, oh, okay, like with the time when this institution was founded, who was actually able to have access to education here and uh, whether it's at Michigan or at another institution, right? So it's just really this idea of just thinking about that historical context um, and really beginning to understand um, or at least gain a better appreciation, an additional appreciation for how history does impact um, where we are today. Um, oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Lisa. I'll just I'll just quickly um, sort of amplify what Tershia was saying because I think one of the important things is that I think if sometimes if you know some of the language can be off-putting to folks, but it's the concrete experiences that I think speak to people and help them see how that how those things have happened historically, and how they how they sort of infiltrate our academic cultures and our disciplinary cultures and the things that count as knowledge, all of those things are really critically important to thinking about equity. But I think we have to start with where folks are and give them sort of concrete examples that they can work with to see how that operates so that it's not a, it's 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 not an off-putting word, but rather a recognition that, ah, yes, these these system these systemic problems have have been there. And they still are there, um, and now I see how that happens. Great. Um, a question related to uh, the research is that 
What are some uh, common arguments from people who might not agree that redefining engineering is a good idea? And are there people who are doing equally rigorous research that attempt to counter the argument about the benefit of integrating equity into engineering? Yeah, I'll, I'll speak to that just as, you know, a, a practicing engineer on the side. Um, I, I don't know if we're redefining engineering. I, I'd be very curious to know what the definition of engineering is. Um, you know, to argue that engineering is not a social discipline, I think, is um, on its face incorrect. Um, engineering is uh, done by people for people, right? So um, either we're attending to the social factors or we're not. Um, and there's obviously implications to not attending uh, to those factors. And I think generally, um, at least, you know, talking to, to many dozen of, of, you know, engineering faculty colleagues, I don't see any argument on that point. The question is, how do you make it um, uh, accessible? Uh, and how do you integrate it in a seamless way? So folks consider it as engineering and not other. And so that's, you know, and, and so looking for content, that's actually where the, the case study part of this actually came from, is we went looking for that content that really makes that clear and didn't find it. Uh, so uh, we did find Sarah, though. So uh, you know, Sarah, you know, uh, started developing that that content and we're seeing a very rapid adoption. So I, I would just sort of take issue with the premise that, you know, we're trying to redefine engineering. Uh, we're just acknowledging, uh, you know, what it's always been. And, you know, there's quotes from Herbert Hoover, you know, engineer president, you know, from 100 years ago, you know, talking about engineering as a social discipline, even even back then. So um, I'll, I'll let others comment, too. Yeah, I, I do think one thing to really keep in mind is that by defining engineering as a socio-cultural or socio-technical discipline, excuse me, I'm using my own language, uh, socio-technical discipline, we're not saying the technical is not important and that's not what students need to learn. We absolutely think students need to learn that. We think there are implications of taking a purely technical view for the people around us and the world around us. And I think you know that's the key is that we're, we're not trying to not teach the technical aspects. We are trying to teach them in a way that acknowledges the acknowledges like the nature of engineering practice in the world is that it's always embedded in these contexts and we need to acknowledge that and to think about how how that interaction happens and with what consequences um with regards to the case studies also uh, one of our panels or uh, participants was asking um how often are students come into contact with the DEI case studies? And I am aware that many more faculty are engaging, but do you have an idea of um, how often the students see the case studies? Yeah, Sarah, you want that one? Um, I can start and maybe you can jump in. Uh, I think in the early years of the project, the place that a student was most likely to see one of the case studies was in the Engineering 100 Introduction to Engineering Design sections, which are themed by the different you know, departments. Uh, and then also some of the capstone design sections. But I, I think our hope and and the place that we're going this fall is to to embed them across these majors so that students are seeing them all the way throughout their experience. And it's not just something you see at the beginning and the end. Yeah, I, I, maybe to speak as well to, you know, the 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 kind of to tie this with the uh, point about rigor from the previous, uh, a question because I, I think rigor is often a, a loaded word. I, I, I don't um, necessarily subscribe to the point that um, because you're taking 30 to 50 minutes to uh, introduce the socio-technical context of um, seawalls in New Orleans and their relationship to um, you know the disaster of Hurricane Katrina, the response, um, you know, the Army Corps approach to uh, developing seawalls and um, using that as a, um, a means to um, not only introduce the context of decisions around material choice and, you know, design of walls, um, but where, you know, where those get implemented. Um, by, you know, spending that 50 minutes, um, and, and we got to do some research to to verify this conjecture, but you know, in in the early days, the way it's feeling, 
is what that's actually doing is creating a lot more motivation to learn the technical work um, and you know, finding uh, you know a certain energy and and inspiration uh, you know to 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 work through the homework set, right? So um, this idea that we can do technical or social, or this idea that socio-technical just waters down technical, I, I think um, that is uh, unproven at best and might be flat wrong. Uh, so, um, you know, to, to kind of circle back, you know, we're finding now, actually to some extent to our surprise, like Sarah mentioned, the first year, the fourth year, these are more design oriented. Um, but actually working, you know, with, with Tershia and the teaching circles and that collaboration, actually, you know, we started to see a lot more second year, third year analysis courses, I mean, you know, very decontextualized classes in general. And um, this seems to be where some of the strongest interest is coming from. We didn't go there first. So we have a lot to learn. Uh, but, um, you know, I, I think the early signs is that this is not a zero sum. Great. And uh, this is probably going to be the last question, um, but it, it deals with the engagement, uh, both from, I would think, the faculty and the student side with the content. What are the ways in which people are prompted to reflect on personal bias and positionality um, with a comment that learning how to do that is a skill in itself? Um, I can talk a little bit about um, our approach to that reflection process um, within the teaching circle. And I think what I would start by saying is that we try to um, meet people where they are um, as we're doing that engagement process. And so thinking about um, looking not having people do some of that initial self-reflective work, thinking about who they are. Um, what power and privilege does that um, offer to them or for to them or not, right? And begin that process of, of prompting that reflection, that reflective process. Um, we may um, have similar moments uh, where we might be thinking about uh, that kind of reflection in both option one and option two, but we'll do it differently, right? Um, depending upon where faculty are on their journey, because we really do believe in the importance of meeting people where they are and wanting them to, um, be able to process things in ways that make sense for them. And so we really want to give faculty that agency to be able to do that work. Um, I don't know if you all wanted to comment about some of that reflection, even within the case study context. Sure, I'll try to be quick about that. I think that we try to do it uh, conceptually. So just to give an example, we have a case study on cashless payment systems for industrial operations. And we ask students at the beginning to think about that as a convenience solution, but like what's convenient to whom? How do you think about convenience based on your own experiences? And then we zoom out from that as the case progresses to ask students to think about how what's convenient for you if you have a smartphone, a credit card, et cetera, might not be for somebody who doesn't have those things. Are you accounting for all those people when you're you know, solving an engineering problem? Great. Um, there was one question in the in the questions that actually is answered in the chat in terms of how to participate in the teaching circles. And there is an interest form that's linked in the chat. If you would like to sign up for or learn more about those teaching circles, please uh, go ahead and use that form. Um, I'd like to thank you, Sarah, Lisa, Tercia, and Steve. We appreciate you taking the time to join us today so that we may all learn more about teaching equity-centered engineering. Uh, our next DEI lecture will be November 15th featuring Emily Obert, who will discuss design justice and how engineers and designers we create, sorry, as how as engineers and designers, we create new technologies and products that can unknowingly marginalize entire groups of people. An invitation will be forthcoming with more details, so please watch your email for that. We hope to see you there. Uh, we will be sending out a survey to collect your feedback on today's lecture, and we'll drop that in the link, um, in, uh, the link in the chat as well. And thank you for attending, and I hope you have a great day.